PhD student there, Nora Mitchell from UC Irvine, Chad Anderson from UC <coughs> Davis, and David DeCamp from Northeastern University, and we're very happy they're all here. Um, they each have 15 minutes, and then we hope to save about, about a half hour for conversation. Great, so good afternoon everyone. Um, so my name is Emily Chiff and my um, paper is entitled Textiles and Majesty in Early Modern Empires from a Global Perspective. And this study contributes to existing debates on the global renaissance by offering a reassessment of theories that have viewed the period from a Eurocentric lens and have regarded the relationship between the East and the West as one marked by cultural incommensurability and the idea of otherness. So as items that pass between and bore witness to contact among different global courts, along trade routes that since Vasco de Gama's monumental discovery of a direct route to the Indies in 1498 made up the world's first truly global trading community, textiles are an unrivaled source for exploring the fluidity of early modern encounter and the effects of cross-cultural contact on both sides of the exchange. And the stories they tell are complex tales of connection, adoption and adaption, but that are defined above all by comprehension and cross-cultural understanding. So textiles in numerous forms, shapes, and sizes, from lavish tapestries measuring up to eight meters to luxurious silks and velvets that would make up a ruler's wardrobe, were fundamental to the display of kingship in courts throughout the early modern world. And in the 16th and 17th centuries, the empires of the old world, Safavid Persia, Mughal India, and the nations of Europe, all used textiles as part of the insignia, display, and ceremonial of rule. So as can be seen from these primary source quotes, a visitor entering any of these early modern courts would have been kind of presented with a similar sight. A magnificent display of fabrics and beauty, walls adorned with gold and crimson, and floors lined with sumptuous carpets. And the visitor's reaction to these displays, that can be seen here, would also have been quite similar. A consciously inspired sense of awe and wonderment, coupled with a strong impression of the power and wealth of the ruler whose court they had just entered. So parallel to the use and function of textiles within these courts, reveals high levels of cross-cultural contact and understanding between different parts of the early modern globe. And textiles operate in the early modern courts in two ways. Firstly, they were items that functioned both ceremoniously and decoratively. And secondly, they also were objects designed to communicate specific messages of rule that went beyond the simple messages of grandeur and luxury. And this would be achieved by the imagery or the embroidery uh, and images that would often be placed on them. And textiles can also be understood understood, sorry, as global items in two main respects. Firstly, as physical objects of ostentation and magnificence, they functioned as part of an ideology of power and display associated with kingship and nobility. And this belief system pertained to courts throughout the globe. Luxurious fabrics act as a form of political propaganda in a plethora of courts. And it is this critical and parallel function that indicates an element of courtly culture that I think can be convincingly described as global. Secondly, their global popularity and use led to a blending of patterns and motifs, which in time manifested into a largely non-figurative courtly aesthetic. So alongside the universal appreciation of textiles as physical expressions of majesty, we find that particular colours, materials, emblems have become internationally popular. So it can be said then that the global courtly culture created its own global aesthetic, which was identified above all by shimmering gold, and this existed alongside and was at times overlain by more indigenous preferences. So how did textiles operate in similar ways in early modern courts and empires, and why were they so, so popular? So textiles have often been overlooked by historians, but they were the most ubiquitous vision items in the 16th and 17th century courts. So we can take these primary source quotes, which are from 17th century Mughal and um, Spanish sources, and it can be seen how textiles formed part of this universal vis visual language of power I mentioned that translated across cultures and old world empires. Textiles set the tone and adorn the stage sets of courtly life. And the pervasive presence of what Mohammed Sandy Cambo refers to in this example of beautiful and external things at the courts quickly fostered an inherent connection between their display and the display of majesty. Indeed, for royal power to be expressed plausibly by the end of the 17th century, as we see in this Spanish example here, the showing of luxury cloth had become a necessary prerequisite. And they were globally popular for a number of reasons. At the most mundane level, textiles provided comfort and decoration <coughs> for royal residences. And for the courts of Northern Europe in particular, they provided much needed warmth for the large drafty palaces. But I think their most important function 
was that they were objects in which the wealth of the ruler could literally be invested and projected. Status and law was something that all rulers relied on for power, and textiles were uniquely <coughs> suited to invoking these emotions as items that embodied wealth in lieu of literally being made of expensive and luxury material. In modern society, we of course continue to portray, up to portray sorry, our status and identity and the clothes we choose to wear, and we respect the quality of our items. And this desire was even more acute in the hierarchical society of the early modern core. So the more luxurious the textile was, the more impressive the message. The third reason why textiles were so popular throughout old world empires and courts was that they were portable in a way that other physical objects of magnificence, such as paintings, were not. And this made them exceptionally valuable in the service of kingship, as the courts of the 16th and 17th centuries were both centers of significant ceremony, but they were also often peripatetic. So, for example, a textile could be brought along with a monarch on progress, whereas a painting couldn't, or could be rolled out at a specific event to project a specific message, and then kind of rolled back up and put in the cupboard again. So, monarchs throughout the old world spared no expense on the finest examples. A 1513 order from the Ottoman Imperial Treasury to the Meijing Weaving Centre at Berta, Berta sorry, totaled 25,000 akka worth of fabric, and akka was the primary monetary unit in the empire. And this was a considerable expenditure for the time. But even saying this, by 1518, this order had risen to 200,000 acre. Moreover, a tapestry set in the 1547 inventory of King Henry VIII of England was valued at 1,500 Great British Pounds, which at the time was the equivalent cost of a battleship. So we can see just how much money these guys were kind of investing in their textiles. So whilst textiles tended to function in similar ways as expressions of power throughout courts, there were differences in the top dominant types on display. I think not surprisingly due to the colder climate, heavier wares such as tapestries tended to dominate in Europe, while silks and velvets were more popular in the Ottoman court, and not pile carpets particularly visible in the Mughal, India, and South of Persia. But in spite of these differences, there is a clear continuity in the materials used to construct the most elite examples. Silk threads and gilt-wrapped metal wire dominate, prompting similar visceral reactions to these magnificent objects. It must be noted that the differences between courts does get more complex when the symbolic and iconographical messages that are attached to textiles in the service of kingship are explored. But as disseminators of pure power, they triggered physical rather than intellectual feelings, and this function transcended national boundaries. In addition to the types of material, the mode usage of textiles is also fairly common across courts. So taking these examples, which are from a number of contemporary paintings and illuminated manuscripts, they provide good evidence of how textiles would often be used to literally frame the monarch in the form of a boldekin. So the boldekin is a canopy of state that would have been brought out um, and placed over the monarch to flank him on public occasions. And we see in these examples that it is represented in both Eastern and Western courts. So this is an example um, from the Holy Roman Empire. This is King Henry VIII. It's not too big there, but I think if we can all know it's Henry. And then these are um, the Ottoman court and the Mughal court. So due to this, the portability that I mentioned, textiles were ubiquitous during public role displays and ceremonies. The most common practice in the East seems to have been the laying of fabrics along royal procession routes. And this can be seen in um, an Ottoman manuscript from the 16th century, um, which is depicting um, festivities that were held for the circumcision of the Ottoman heir apparent Mehmed in 1582. And we quite clearly here see the laying of gold cloth um, at the foot of his horse. And a related outdoor display of textiles occurred at European courtly events. For example, in 1511, an eyewitness reported on celebrations marking the creation of the Holy League in Venice, stating that carpets and tapestries completely covered the outside of the Doge's palace. In fact, the connection of expensive textiles and ability was such that royal spaces could be used creating them alone. And the most well-known example of this is probably at the 1520 meeting of the Field of Cloth of Gold, where textiles were used in a field outside of Calais to create a temporary court for the meetings of Kings Henry VIII of England and Francis I of France to sign a long-awaited peace treaty. And they were using such large quantities of this event, both as exteriors and interiors, that it has come to be named after the dominant textile on display. And this is an example of cloth of gold. But this was kind of a, an unprecedented event. A more commonplace example of textiles, textiles being used to create royal spaces was the customary erecting of tents during breaks in royal progresses, campaigns, or pilgrimages. And this is especially common in Islamic areas, as the 16th century saw intermittent wars between the Ottomans and 
Safavids, which meant that their rulers were often outside the physical court. So we have a great source from a Venetian traveller. He spent some time with the Persian court um, excuse me, in the 16th century, and he describes here how the tents looked and functioned as royal spaces during a war campaign. And I think it's striking how the richness and colour scheme of the tents that are described here, during the gold and deep red, are strikingly similar to the cloth of gold represented in a 19th century painting of the event which bears its name. Excuse me, and here's... There's an example from it there. The similarity of these cloths displayed in the east and west there, I think shows how they were used to speak a language of luxury and royal power the world over. And textiles not only have important things to tell us about the nature of cross-cultural communication and understanding through their appreciation and function as physical expressions of wealth and grandeur in old world courts, but they were also often literally global items. For a mixture of trade and diplomacy, they were passed between courts. We see in inventories of, inventories of Eastern and Western rulers that they commonly include wares that originated in other areas. So in the collection that exists at the Toscopo Palace in Istanbul today, we have examples of Mamluk, Safafid, Italian, and Mughal textiles, and a 1579 Mughal inventory also mentions the existence of European velvets in the royal household. Eastern wares likewise had a significant presence in Europe. In Russia at the Kremlin, there are currently over 200 items of Ottoman and Safavid silk from the 16th and 17th centuries. So textiles found in early modern courts clearly function in a global context and were a central feature and often the result of connections between courts of the early modern world. The centrality of the merchant to their trade is an essential feature of their global story. And one particularly prolific company was the Van Els, a family of merchants from the Netherlands who rose to prominence in the 1520s. And the Met Museum in New York actually just did a, an exhibition on the Van Els. So the Van Els provided tapestries for all the major courts of Europe, including France, Spain, and England, and they also had connections with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, we have records of a Peter Cook Van Els, as part of a group of merchants at the court of Suleiman I in 1533, who was sent there with the explicit task to secure commissions for tapestries from the Sultan. The visit comes to no avail, but I think it is a good example of just how far-reaching these merchant contacts could be. So if the activity of mobile merchants such as the Van Ouds meant that many textiles that found in early modern courts actually had decidedly international origins. For example, one of France's the first most lavish tapestry commissions, um, the Last Supper, which we see here, was an item commissioned and displayed by the French court, based in Italian design and produced in the Netherlands. Textiles were also passed between courts as part of the diplomatic relations between rulers. Um, gift giving was an internationally accepted form of princely tribute in this period, and this then served as a second means by which overseas wares would find themselves utilised as part of the physical display of power of foreign kings. I think a good and probably my favourite example of just how global the exchange is taking place in this gift giving could be is the English ambassador Sir Thomas Rowe's gift of a couch covered in Chinese velvet to the Mughal Emperor Jahangir in 1615. So what we have here is a European giving a Chinese textile to an Indian prince. So textiles made with luxurious materials, shimmering of silk and gilt wrapped threads, were thus passed back for and between courts of the early modern world, where they were subsequently displayed to impress. The visceral and aesthetic impressions engendered by these items saw them work in a number of cultures, and in numerous instances, these cross-cultural contexts actually further led to a cross-fertilization in the designs of the products themselves. And this brings me to the second part of my argument on the global nature of textiles, that through this exchange, the global court culture, in effect, fashions, fashions its own non-figurative global courtly aesthetic. And I think the aesthetic is most clearly seen in one of the most prominent textiles of early modern courts, cloth of gold. So we have three examples here. Um, so two of these um, are preserved in the Metropolitan Museum of Art New York, and the third is in the Washington D.C. Textile Museum. And they're all 16th, 16th century samples of this material, this cloth of gold. But whilst they look strikingly similar, I think both in palette and pattern, they have pretty different origins. So the items at the Met um, originate from um, the Ottoman Empire and Italy, and the item at the Textile Museum is Persian. So what we see in these examples is a style made up of different cultural motifs, blended together to make a truly global pattern. In terms of colour, the red hue in all these objects is an Italian preference, 
or as the dominant emblems of the pomegranate and artichoke, which we see here as the pomegranate, um, are their ultimate um, motifs, classically. So the pomegranate features in each textile, and although it is portrayed slightly differently in some, I think this, in this indicates how globally popular emblems were often appropriated or overlaying the features more specific to the taste of the court in which they operated. And the international aesthetic seen in these examples of cloth of gold therefore existed alongside more culturally specific design preferences. Nonetheless, despite variations, I think the clear visual connections between the finished products can be argued to represent a non-figurative aesthetic that can be convincingly described as global. And this is evidence for me most clearly in the parallel use of the agaibal lattice, um, which is kind of this pattern here, compromised with symmetrical diamond-shaped segments with rounded ends that surround the central motifs as the main structural pattern of all of these weaves. This design has commonly been described as a shared Italian and Ottoman aesthetic, but as the examples demonstrate, it has a further global pedigree. The Gaibal lattice was a pattern that we also see commonly in the Mughal Empire, Empire in this period. So this is an example of a 17th century Indian pashmina carpet that illustrates this, and I think reinforces the fact that patterns were easily appropriated within a number of cultures and a number of courts. The motifs used in this carpet are also indicative of further cross-cultural borrowing and blending. The small red and yellow flowers that we see here are kind of reminiscent of Tudor roses, and the leaf-like fauna that at points binds the lattice together bears a striking similarity to that seen in the Persian cloth of gold. So to conclude then, what was happening between courts was not a simple copying of designs from one area to another, but a two-way creation of a genuinely global aesthetic. This was fostered by the cross-cultural communication exchange that was taking, across, taking place across early modern courts and empires. The global courtly aesthetic was born of a, global, a wider global court culture that incorporated a theory of power which connected luxury items with noble status and majesty and thus resulted in a desire for the same types of rich and impressive textiles. Consequently, they were used in parallel ways across and between courts as vital expressions of royal power. The story of early modern court textiles in old world empires then is thus a global one of cross-cultural connection and commensurability. Thank you. For